So this, uh, the title of this series is The Spirit and the Cross. And the subtitle is The Work of the Holy Spirit in the Process of Salvation. And that subtitle will come in handy to explain lessons that we're going to do in the, in the future. So lesson one is our concept of God. We're going to do this a uh, couple of lessons on our concept of God. So by its very nature, this course is uh, not meant to be easy with me uh, kind of repeating things that you already know and already agree with. A lot of times classes are like that. You know, you, you go to a Bible class and the teacher is just saying things that you know, and it's good, it's edifying, it's encouraging, but this is not one of those, okay? These uh, lessons will be uh, complex at times. Not all premises will be straightforward and it'll require an effort to stay focused. However, those uh, who take the course will be rewarded uh, if you stay with it. Uh, for example, you'll have a greater and more accurate understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, what He does, and the nature of His relationship with the Father and the Son. No discussion of God can be complete if you don't talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the relationship that they have with one another and the relationship they have with us. So we'll be pursuing that, that thread of, of thought. Also, we'll have an overview of the Bible from a fresh perspective, a different perspective in looking at the scriptures. Uh, these lessons will provide a greater understanding of Pentecostal and charismatic believers and why they think the way they do about the Holy Spirit and why they think and what they do about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why do they think that? Why do they believe that? Why do they do what they do? How did they get there? I'm always interested in that. How do people get to where they are? You know, what thought process? What scripture brought them to that conclusion? So we'll be talking about that. And then hopefully you'll appreciate the divine work of redemption more perfectly. It's about redemption, you know. Our life is about redemption. And so knowing more about that uh, blesses our life, makes it more rewarding. You can watch a lot of movies and you can read a lot of books about stuff that's interesting, but when you're reading or learning about redemption, you're reading and learning about something that has taken place in your own life, our own lives. So some of the ground rules, um, one of the main reasons we have problems talking about and communicating effectively about our faith, you know, New Testament Christianity, with another believer in Christ, say someone who's a Catholic, is that we use the same words. Okay, you're talking to your uncle and he's Catholic, or you're talking to your buddy at work and he, you know, he's Catholic or Orthodox or somebody's a, a, a Baptist or whatever. The problem is a lot of times that um, we're using the same words in the discussion. We're using the words priest and church and baptism. And, but the problem is that these words mean different things to the member of the Church of Christ, for example, who's a New Testament Christian, than they do to, for example, a member of the Roman Catholic Church. I mentioned that example because it's the one that is most you know, familiar to me because I grew up Catholic and all of our relatives on both sides, on Lisa's side, my side, everybody is, everybody is Catholic. And recently there have been some, you know, her sister passed away a couple of months ago and then her, her other sister now has been found to have cancer. And you know, she has tried to open up the discussion about religion 
you know, this important topic and it's been futile. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that the vocabulary, you just, just getting over the vocabulary is like a, you know, a high mountain. i give you an example. So if you're a New Testament Christian, that's us, New Testament Christian, the word priest, well, first of all, it's the Jewish priests who offered sacrifices in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. That's a priest. Or it's the spiritual role of each Christian man or woman who offer their service and themselves to God in purity and in service, right? Romans, uh, Romans 12, 1, 1 Peter 2, 9. Uh, it's the spiritual goal of each Christian. I want to become a priest in the household of God. When I'm talking to my sister-in-law, for example, or brother-in-law, and I say the word priest, well, they may have the same concept of the biblical priesthood in the Old Testament. They don't study that very much. But for them, the priest is the local minister in the neighborhood parish who conducts mass and administers the sacraments to the Catholic faithful. They would never associate themselves with the word priest. And it's also the title of the lowest level of Catholic clergymen. Well, you've got the nuns and the brothers further down, I guess, you know. But the local parish priest, he's, he's the lowest person. Uh, well, I can say he's the lowest guy and, and be politically correct because there are no women priests. So, because then you have you know, the bishop, then you have the archbishop, then you have a cardinal, you have the, you know, and then all kinds of things, the pope, but all kinds of things. So we, uh, we don't speak the same language. If you're a New Testament Christian, I only pick two. If you're a New Testament Christian, baptism, okay. Imagine baptism, imagine your baptism. What was it? An immersion in water of a repentant believer as an expression of faith, at which time this person receives forgiveness of sin and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and is added to the church by God. That's kind of our concept of baptism. We read in uh, Acts 2.38, it says, and Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There's the reason. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the result, another result. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3000 souls. Of all passages, I think as Christians, this passage is pretty familiar to us. So when you mention baptism, you know, oh yeah, I remember, you know. November 1977, I was there with Jim Metter and another guy named Bill, Bob. Anyways, just the three of us. And Jim Metter, we went into the baptistry and he immersed me and it was cold because uh, we didn't have a heated baptistry in Montreal. So the water was cold in November, I remember that. But that's what I'm thinking when I'm thinking baptism, that's what we're all thinking, isn't it? But again, when I talk to my brother-in-law, about baptism, uh, what he thinks is, well, it's sprinkling of water on a baby based on the faith of the baby's parents or godparents in order to remove original sin and join the Catholic Church. That's what he thinks when we use the word baptism. This same person according to Catholic, according to my brother-in-law, according to Catholic doctrine, this very same baby receives the Holy Spirit several years later. In other words, you're baptized when you're a baby and then when you're maybe 12 years old, the age of reason, 
Then there's a ceremony called confirmation, right? I see some of you moving your lips, you ex-Catholics. And, uh, and, and confirmation is the bishop comes and there's a special mass and you get all dressed up and, and, and I remember mine, you know, and, and we all line up and we go forward and the bishop is standing or sitting you know, at the front. And when you come to the bishop, he, he puts his hand on your forehead, laying on of hands, you know, and, and he says, receive you the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit part is given by the bishop, by the laying on of hands. Did you see the mixture of things? You see how it's like they, they've taken the, the deck of cards here. It's like the, the New Testament's the deck of cards and they've reshuffled it. Now all of a sudden the baby is baptized, 12 years later receives the Holy Spirit uh, by the laying on of hands of the bishop. And my argument, well, where do you find that in the Bible? Oh, no, no. We don't have to find it in the Bible. It's church law, church tradition, which counts just as much as the Bible. So I'm trying to express the idea of communication when it comes to religion, uh, not just with Catholic people, but with Baptist uh, individuals, believers who are Baptist, believers who are Methodist, believers who are Jehovah Witnesses, whatever, they're believers. But they use biblical language in different ways. And if you want to have a conversation where you actually are making progress and exchanging ideas, you have to kind of you know, peel the onion. You have to kind of get to a point where you agree what words mean. So at least then you can have a discussion. Otherwise, you know, you're talking like this. You're talking like this. So we could continue demonstrating the differences in the meanings of religious words that sound and look the same, but are given different meanings and applications by different groups and all of them claim to be Christian. And all of them claim to believe the Bible. I mean, every, every individual, every believer of any church group that I've ever met has always claimed, oh, we believe the Bible. Absolutely, we believe in, in the Bible. So this phenomenon, you know, same words, different meanings, is to a certain extent the reason for so much division within Christianity and why it is so difficult to have the kind of dialogue necessary to create unity in the church. Therefore, when, when I mention ground rules, I'm referring to a basic rule that will guide our study so that we can all agree on the conclusions we arrive at in the study of the Holy Spirit. And there's really only one, and here it is. The one ground rule is the Bible is the only reliable source of information concerning the Holy Spirit. That's the basic ground rule. You'd think that would be you know, everybody would go, yeah, but you'd be surprised at how many people would debate this idea. The only reliable source of information about the Holy Spirit is the Bible, period. Now, some may ask why this is so. Two reasons. One, the Bible was authored by the Holy Spirit who enabled different writers to write and preserve it. Second Peter says, 121, for no prophecy, no utterance, no, you know, no spoken word about God by prophets or teachers or anything like that. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. It's not prophecy if someone says, you know, I think I'm going you know, to talk about this tonight at church. That's not prophecy. That's you talking. You might be talking accurately about what the Bible says, but it's not prophecy. 
So for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Interesting that word there, men moved, the Greek word there, um, gives the image of the wind uh, 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 pushing a sailboat. So the man is the boat, but the Holy Spirit's the wind that directs the man, you know, where to go, what to write, what to say. And secondly, no new information not already contained in the Bible has been revealed. You know, I've uh, been part of a Pentecostal movement before I became a Christian, just a simple New Testament Christian, I was searching. You know, I had exhausted my search in the Catholic Church. I asked enough questions and you know, they, they just didn't have the answers. And I went, you know, when you're searching, I tried different things, went to different people, joined a religious group who were charismatic, Pentecostals, spoke in tongues, cast out spirits, prophecy, you know, the whole nine, the whole nine yards. And when we were at meetings or something, you know, sister so-and-so says, I have a word from the Lord. That's prophecy. Or they would say, I, I, you know, I, sus I don't suspect this, but I, the spirit tells me that you are possessed with a spirit of jealousy. And we're going to pray for you to cast out that spirit of jealousy. And everybody speak in tongues, you know, cast that spirit out of me. You know. It was, I felt like a Kleenex box. <laughs> Every week I had something new that could, you know, could be removed. In Jude 3, the writer says, beloved, while I was making every, every effort to write you about our common salvation, that was Jude's intention. He wanted to write about, you know, reinforce the idea that perhaps we're saved by God's grace through the process of faith. You know, while I was thinking about those things, he says, I felt the necessity to write to you. In other words, he changed his mind because of things that were happening in the church. And if we were doing a study of Jude, we'd go all through you know, what, 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 what false doctrines were happening and so on and so forth. But he says, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing to you that you contend earnestly, fight for, fight for, earnestly. For what? For the faith. I think you've heard this in many Bible classes. If you say, I have faith, that means I believe. I believe is true or I trust. But when there's an article, the faith, then they're talking about the body of teaching. Okay? So the faith is the teaching, the doctrines. So he says, fight for the faith, the teachings, which was once for all handed down to the saints. So what's he saying? The teachings have been given to the saints once and for all. There is no more revelation. We have revelation, it's here but we don't have any extra revelation. That's why we're not Mormons. That's why we're not Jehovah Witnesses or other groups who rely on the extra revelation of their founders and their, their teachers. That's the second ground rule. There's revelation, all right, about the Holy Spirit, about the Godhead, about the Trinity, we're going to talk about that. There is revelation about that, but it's in here. I myself am not bringing any re re uh, revelation from me. I'm bringing to you what I've studied from here. That's why everything you know, is proof text. 
to make sure that <clears throat> we're speaking from the Spirit of God, from God's word and not from, not from self. So those are the, those are the ground rules, okay? Now I'm not saying that there's no longer any experience of God, that's not the same thing. But all experience and knowledge of Him that is genuine is always confirmed by the Bible. So this study of the Holy Spirit is based solely on what the Bible teaches about Him and how He interfaced with different individuals in the Bible and not any experience that I or someone I knew or heard about felt or experienced the power or presence of the Spirit. In many teachings from other groups, you'll hear the person say, I, they'll talk about their witness of the Spirit and how the Spirit revealed to them you know, what was supposed to happen and what's, you know, this class is not that. Yeah, once in a while I get a revelation, but the revelation I get is I'm reading the word and I go, oh, I never saw that before. Oh, now I get it. Oh, I'm reading this passage. This passage explains that passage. Okay, I've just added you know, another piece to the puzzle. Yeah, I've gotten that revelation, but, but so have you. But a lot of times in churches, uh, on TV, online especially, oh boy, uh, you know, you get people who are speaking of their own authority, their own spiritual authority, you know, based on their private revelation from God. And what I'm saying to you is that does not happen. That is not legitimate. It might be sincere, but it's not legitimate, okay? So this study of the Holy Spirit is based solely on what the Bible teaches about Him and nothing else. The main rule that we can agree on and that will maintain objective and not subjective conclusions is that all the information we're going to examine about the Holy Spirit will come from the Bible. No other source materials will be used. All right, so the basis for understanding the Holy Spirit comes from His position and role, watch me now, within the Trinity, there I've said it, within the Trinity. Some of you may be thinking that I've already violated our basic ground rule for this study, you know, that all teachings must come from the Bible and you're thinking because the word Trinity doesn't even appear in the Old Testament. And you're correct. The term Trinity does not appear, but the dynamic nature of God requires a word to capture His essence. And words like the Godhead or Trinity have been coined in order to express His likeness in a single word. So we can, if you're curious, when did this start? We can trace back the use of this term Trinity to the third century AD and the early church father or leader by the name of Tertullian. He had already, excuse me, there had already been many theories and doctrinal pronouncements trying to explain more precisely the nature of God's being. However, Tertullian offered the first defense of the doctrine of the Trinity and explicitly defined it as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This, as was the case for the compilation of the official text of the New Testament canon, was done in order to respond and to refute a major heresy which was being circulated and gaining popularity in the church at the time. In other words, you know, at the beginning, people thought Jesus was returning in their own lifetime. You know, the early saints, the first century saints, they thought, well, you know, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back in our lifetime. 
this is, uh, then, then all of a sudden, some of them started to die off or be killed as martyrs. And they began to realize, well, uh, maybe he's not coming back in our lifetime. And at the same time, there were individuals circulating what they were proposing as inspired uh, uh, literature. And so the leaders of the church got together and said, you know, we've got all these letters from Paul and Peter and you know, we, we need to make up our mind, you know, which letters are authentic and which ones are not. Uh, long story short, they, they tried to form a canon a canon, meaning a measure, a canon, the official canon, the official books, the official inspired books. And there were all kinds of rules. You know, it had to have been circulating for many, many years. A book had to be accepted by the church as inspired already to qualify for consideration. And after a couple of centuries of discussion and so on and so forth, we came up with the canon. 27 books of the New Testament and they've stayed the same. Well, it's the same thing for the idea of the Trinity. A lot of ideas about God and God's nature were circulating. And uh, one particular idea um, called, uh, by a man called uh, Praxius, hang on a second there, right? Uh, really took hold, uh, which was uh, false. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tertullian came up with a response to defend against the false idea. So the false idea by this uh, man called Praxius, he, he taught that God was one and that all references to deity like the Son of God or the Holy Spirit were simply different ways of referring to the one God. He was attempting to merge Old Testament teaching about God with the revelations contained in the New Testament about God's dynamic nature. And he came up with this theory. So this heresy was met with a tract written by Tertullian. And as I said, he was a Christian apologi uh, apologist writer who lived in Carthage. The tract clarifying the triune nature of God in the Bible was called, of all things, against Praxius. So you kind of knew, you kind of knew his position. You knew Tertullian's position because his tract was called against Praxius. And it was successful in eliminating Praxius' idea about God's singular nature and promoting the triune concept as well as the term Trinity by which it was explained in short form. So Tertullian then was the first one to use the term Trinity in the third century. And we have people today who consider, you know, who continually reject this idea of the tri triune nature of, uh, of God. He wrote, Tertullian, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one in essence, not one in person. In other words, it's not just God who's got a bunch of different names. Sometimes we call him this, sometimes we call him that. No, he's not one person. His ideas were not immediately accepted by all Christians, but with time, his idea that the Bible actually taught that God's nature was triune and an accurate way to refer to it was the term Trinity became acceptable to most believers. Of course, even today, there are still many who reject this term and idea of God's triune nature. So we're going to review both Old Testament and New Testament texts that teach us about the composition and nature of God's being. So let's start with the Old Testament, shall we? The Old Testament teaches implicitly the idea of the triune God. It's there, but it's not explicitly stated. However, the oneness of God is stressed. So we read in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four of the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, the Shema. 
Now, this early focus on there being only one God and no other was a natural emphasis for the religion of a people who had traditionally followed after and included many different gods in their personal and corporate worship. You know, if, if, if you're trying to teach people about the true God and the people you're trying to teach about the true God have a history of having lots of gods, they, got a, they have a God for every day. They have a God for everything. You know, the, the nature God and the, the harvest God and the fertility God and the, whatever. They got gods for everything. Well, what's one of the first things you're going to teach those people? Well, you're going to teach those people there's only one God. Get rid of all those other gods because there's only one God. That's why you have this here. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. There's just one God. That was the emphasis of the uh, Old Testament. And so the first step in worship of the true and living God was to acknowledge that there was only one of him, no others like him, and he tolerated no other gods in his place. I am the Lord thy God, right? First commandment. This is not to say, however, that there was no mention of his dynamic nature in the Old Testament. It was just that mention of his dynamic nature was implicit, not explicit. So the idea of a triune God, Trinity, is implicitly suggested in the opening account of Genesis, for example. In Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Note that God is initially presented as a distinct person apart from his creation. This is not pantheism where there are many gods or God is an impersonal force or multiple forces in the universe. This is the idea behind Star Wars and other sci-fi books and movies. You know, the force, the force be with you. People think, oh, a new idea they came up with. How clever, I mean, I mean it's 5,000 years old, that idea. God is not an impersonal force. Also the concept behind the idea of mother nature, which is a personification of the force idea. Women being the bearer of children, you know, it's natural to say, well, nature produces, you know, produces new trees and fruit and harvests and that would be female. So that's just a personification of the idea that God is a force. Well, let's call, him, let's call that force mother nature. Note also that this first mention of God in Genesis is not monism, where everything is God and God is in all of his creation. You know, the, God is the tree and the tree is God and God is in the river and the river is God. That's monism. Most native religions, you know, when you have Native American and all Native peoples of other countries, most Native religions are monism, where God or the force is, is, is the same as the earth. It's also the basis for Eastern religions. But the Bible clearly states that God created the world, but He is apart from it. A tree is just a tree. It is part of God's creation, but it's not part of God. You know, many, not all, not all, but many extreme uh, environmental groups that treat you know, environmentalism almost as a religion is because they believe that there's something spiritual about the creation. The creation is beautiful, it's wondrous to behold, but it isn't God. Okay. Let's read another passage, Genesis 1, 2. It says, the earth was formless and void and darkness 
was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So the spirit now is mentioned as a separate being, distinct yet not personified so early in the development of Revelation. They don't call him the Holy Spirit, just the spirit of God. We have to talk about progressive revelation at this point. Progressive revelation is a term used to describe the way God revealed himself and his plan of salvation. There could have been no revelation. You live, you die, and from Adam to the last person on earth, you don't know about God and his purposes from one generation to another. You know, what would that do? Well, that would produce despair. No answer to the question, you know, <laughs> who is God? Why am I here? What's going to happen? Or you are born uh, with all the godly knowledge already uploaded to your brain. The problem here is that this would violate man's free will and transform us into soulless auto humanities. The third option is progressive revelation of God himself his will for mankind, as well as his plan of salvation. But that, all of that information is revealed progressively in stages. This maintains man's free will status and it provides hope in the face of insurmountable sin and inevitable destruction. And it makes possible the experience of joy as we have the possibility in every generation to continually discover and grow in the ongoing and never ending knowledge of God himself and God's plan for man's salvation, the knowledge and proclamation of which never grows old or tiring. I'm never tired of hearing the gospel. I'm never tired of hearing about it. And so, through this progressive revelation, which God uses to reveal himself and his plans, we begin and we continue to learn about the Holy Spirit, as well as the Father and the Son, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. For example, we learn from both David and Job that the Holy Spirit sustains the created world. In Job 34, it says, if he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. What does that say? The spirit of God sustains the creation. Without the spirit of God, willfully, consciously sustain, sustaining the creation, it would perish and turn to dust. Another writer talks about this far in the past. Uh, David says, you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Again, saying it in a different way. The Holy Spirit continually renews the creation so that man can survive and exist in it, so that God's plan can be worked out over the centuries. These writers are writing some six centuries after Moses' preliminary inspired remarks about the Holy Spirit in Genesis, each of them adding new and more precise information about the role of the Holy Spirit in creation. So in these passages written by different inspired believers, we see the progress of the information given by God about the Holy Spirit. We learn about his power and his work. So this is an example of progressive revelation. Okay, one more, Genesis 1 verse three, let's read that. It says, then God said, let there be light and there was light. In this passage, we see that the word of God is given as a distinct power. God speaks the world into existence. This idea is confirmed in the New Testament in Hebrews 11 verse three. 
It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Why, why do I believe you know, God created the universe and you know, everything works the way it works? Because I can understand it? No. Because I have scientific proof that I can you know, figure it all out mathematically? No. I'm told by God to accept that he created the world. That's the only way that I, <laughs> that I can understand the existence of the world. I, I don't have to knock myself out to quote, understand it. He says, here's what you have to understand. The worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Bingo. I don't have to understand any further than that. John expands this idea by explaining the dynamic present in the Godhead, where God refashions the very essence of his being according to his will and his purpose. John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now watch the change. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In these two verses, John refers to three distinct entities of God. God, the Word, and the Son, and then the Word made flesh. And so at this point, someone could reasonably argue that all three, God, Word, and Son, are the same person, which is God. And John is only describing you know, transitions taking place in God's nature from God to word to the son. However, through progressive revelation, just in John's gospel, we soon realize that there are three distinct beings united within a single Godhead, existing, functioning, and expressing their deity without repeating or compromising uh, the unity within the Jewish Shema that declared the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now I said that the Trinity is suggested by the opening verses of Genesis. Here's one last example. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. Note that the Bible says, let us make man. The Hebrew pluralizes for emphasis sake. It not only states that God is the one who makes man and that man is created and not an evolved being. The passage also reveals something about the creator as well. The term Elohim is the plural form for God. Why it says, let us make man. And so in our study of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit in particular, we see that from the very beginning, scripture suggests the dynamic and diverse nature of God. It doesn't provide all of the information to give us a complete picture and understanding right at the outset, but through a process of progressive revelation, God will steadily reveal greater clarity and knowledge about many key truths, including man's condition and God's plan to save him as well as a clearer picture of his true nature and his true being. This is God's promise. And so two last scriptures very quickly. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. That's progressive revelation. I know some of it now, I kind of see it now, but then I'll see it clearly. And then one last passage, 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Progressive revelation, progressive development of ourselves along with that progressive revelation. All right, next week, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit a little more directly and that, uh, make the point that the Holy Spirit is God.
make some comparisons. All right, thank you for your attention and your patience. See you next time.